All right, peeps, here we go. We're going to start up chapter two, ecosystems and ecology. Um, yeah, starting off with chapter 2.1, species and population. I'm going to have you define abiotic and define biotic. If you can read the word bio, you probably realize these mean life. Well, at least biotic does. Abiotic, not so much. So the opposite of life is non-living. All right, good. Now we're moving down here. Pro tip. They cover this right here on this part right here. If you're in my class, you probably just took the IBDP exam for chapter one. And that's the first time you've ever taken it. And it probably took you for a ride. You know, it's about, it's not too easy, is it? So, um, yep, just the way it is. One thing you should do is be a little bit more specific with um, different things. Like they brought up instead of saying like forest, be with a specific type of forest, whether it's an ash tree forest, deciduous forest, oak forest, stuff along that nature. Also beach, um, instead of just saying it's a beach, be like, hey, you know, it's a Narragansett yellow sand beach. So um, different things, just looking forward to these IBDP exams. So ecosystems, organisms plus their environment, interactions between living and non-living components. Your school building is an ecosystem. You are a living thing, hopefully at least. And your school building is not. And it's just how you interact with it. It's how you go down the hallway. It's how you utilize it. It's how you, the different systems you have in place. Uh, scientific names are the genius name and then the species name. The first letter is going to be capitalized, much like a noun. And the whole name is underlined or italicized. So I can put the example right here. Homo sapiens. The H is capitalized. The whole thing is uh, tell us size. So that's your scientific name going forward. Um, define species for me, define population, and define habitat. You're probably gonna have to do these in your own words. If you can't, well, you can use Google, but realize that the Google definition, you're probably not going to remember come quiz time. So three factors that affect population size are the natality, the birth rate, the mortality, which is the death rate, and then migration. Think of it like this, birth rate, what do you got coming in? Death rate, what do you got going out? Same thing for losing weight. Food and uh, beverages, calories, what do you got coming in? Versus what do you have going out? Ah, running, all right. Um, are you burning more calories than you're consuming? Are we having more people die than are being born? If that's the case and you want to keep that population about even, you got to start immigration because you got to bring in more new people. So conversely, too, if you got too many people and your environment can't support it, probably emigrating. So probably going off where um, you can survive or thrive. So if the school building has too many students, and you're not succeeding at that school, some of you are going to go leave for another school where you will succeed. So um, let's talk about this in the United States. In the United States, our birth rate, our natality is decreased. You know, obviously you got two people that get together. They can have a kid, you know. Problem is those two people will eventually die and then they only left one kid. So you really need to keep um, the population, um, you need the natality to be as, like if your mortality rate is two people are gonna die, you need two people that are gonna come in and live. So, um, yeah. So if we don't have that in the United States, I think our natality rate is like 1.8 or something last time I checked. So to offset that, we've got immigration where we're trying to bring in new people into this country. Now that could be a whole bag of worms pol political wise, whether it's legal or illegal, but we don't really need to get into that here. Um, tell me how the natality, mortality and migration relate to the United States. All right. Um, if you're listening to me, you got a pretty good idea. A niche is how an organism makes a living. My niche is to be an educator, be a teacher. So that's what I do to pay the bills. Uh, biotic factors. Look at these at page 57. Hey, what do you know? They're right down here. You probably want to throw these in your notes. Abiotic factors. Look these up. Page 58. They're going to be right there. 
so abiotic factors. So sweet, right? Let's get that up there. Bring this derp, over there. Cooking now. Good. No two species can inhabit the same niche, same place, same time. So um, I know that there's bears and there's wolves, but they compete for different resources. Um, they can be in the same place. Um, usually not at the same time. They usually fight that out. Um, but they're usually but they're not competing for the same resources. Your fundamental niche is the full range of conditions for survival. Humankind, we could potentially live up in the tundra, but not too many of us really choose to do that. So look at the population of Greenland compared to, say, Virginia, you know, in the United States. More people are living in Virginia, um, which is more our realized niche. There's a certain situation like where we like to live. Could some of us survive on Survivor? Yeah. Do we really choose to? Doesn't really fit my bougie lifestyle. So, all right. Next two vocab words are important and they're used in every chapter. Define limiting factors and define carrying capacity. Limiting factors, they're kind of the um, resources or things that stifle growth, all right? Carrying capacity is the amount of a population that you can get to in a given environment. Limiting factors stop population growing larger. So food is usually one of them. There's other ones too. Temperature. Um, looking down here, how does phosphate limit the population growth in aquatic ecosystems? Ooh, and what is the butterfly effect? Both of these you will find on uh, let me see what we got butterfly i'm sorry butterfly effect is down here which that is going to be on page 58 and right above it you're going to find about the phosphate limiting the growth in aqua aquatic ecosystems so which brings us off to po uh, population interactions over here so no living thing or habitat stays the same. It adapts or dies. It's that simple. Um, fire, you know, different things that affect ecosystems. Fire does, natural disasters do, human activities do, climate change, invasive insects as well. So there's different things where Mother Nature has that reclaims an ecosystem. Uh, you can build beach houses on a you know a beach in Florida right until a hurricane comes and knocks them right out. They're actually looking at that in Key West right now. What is sustainable? Because with the ocean rising, there's a lot of land that's going to be disappearing. What do you do with home buyers there? They own the land that's now disappearing. You know, do you just say, hey man, you're out of luck? Or do you have the town kind of buy them out and be like, yeah, this is going to be gone anyway? So um just different things to think about. So in the 2013 locust plague in Madagascar, what crop did it destroy? So going to want to know about that. Let's talk about competition. Competition happens um, in different ways. You know, it, competition exists because organisms affect other organisms and there's always a set amount of resources. So, um, you're going to be competing with other human beings for jobs. It's a global marketplace right now. So just keep that in mind. Um, only the strongest survive, I guess. So yeah, do well. Um, Interspecific competition, competition between members of the same species. So when you've got humankinds, you know, fighting over jobs, fighting over resources, Right now, humankind, we're kind of fighting over the energy sector, which is oil, coal, natural gas, stuff along that nature. Um, that is an intraspecific competition um, because we're the same species. It's not really there if the population is small. Guess what? The population for humankind, though, pretty big. Um, there's more when carrying capacity is reached. So the more humans we put on this world, the more we're going to be fighting over energy. 
which comes for right now mostly from fossil fuels. Uh, relate this to Fat Bear Week. So Fat Bear Week, you got bears. They hang out in the in the river. They look for salmon. Yummy, right? Um, of course, there's some spots in the river that are better picking than others. And that's where you got the big old bears. And they're like, all right, I'm the OG. I get to hang out here. So um, some species get territorial. I know those bears do. They're like, hey, you young cub. Uh-uh, this is my falls. I've been rocking this thing for five years. Come back when you're about 200 pounds heavier and you got a little bit more scars on you. Um, st st uh, this sta intraspecific stabilizes uh, population growth. So it puts a cap on it. Make sure that it doesn't go too far high or too low. Interspecific and this is where we're going to go on off towards this one right down here. This is on page 60. Interspecific competition is between different species. Sh they share a resource or competitive exclusion. One species outcompetes the other. Um, coyotes and actually, let's go with hyenas and lions. Hyenas and lions are not the same species. However, do they both go for somewhat of the same prey? Generally, okay. Um, don't get me wrong. Lions take down bigger prey, but, you know, and hyenas might go for smaller prey, but there's that prey that's in the middle where they kind of both gnaw on them, go, go hunting for them. So they either can share the resource, hyenas and li lions, none too likely, or competitive exclusion. One species outcompetes the other. So they're always kind of in that in the zone. Uh, this reduces the carrying capacity because both species fight for the same resource. So you'll never really have the hyena population go out of control because then the, you know, the lions start taking their share and then the hyenas, you know, population cells. Conversely too, you never have the lions go too high because the hyenas kind of undercut them. So the populations are always kind of going like that. Um, Predation is predator and prey. So not really a competition thing. It's like you're there, you're yummy, and I'm a predator. Yar! Or you're the prey and you're like, ah, run. All right. Uh, herbivory, kind of like predation, except for in this time, instead of the, you know, predator is just an animal and the prey is the plant. So kind of makes me think about vegans a little bit differently, you know? Um, you know, you start looking at it that way. So parasitism, one species lives in or on another for food. So parasites, you know, they, they basically live off the other. Uh, parasite doesn't kill the host. That's a big thing, a uh, key point, unlike predation. So mutualism uh, is a relationship with two or more species benefiting. Symbiotically is where they live together. Um, commensalism is where one partner is helped, but the other is not really helped, but they're not really hindered either. So it's like, man, just go with it. Um, I think the book uses, uh, ferns or growing up a tree, um, tree doesn't really benefit from it, but ferns definitely benefit from having the tree there. So, uh, Relate legumes and ribosomes to mutualism. It's page 62 in the book. And it is right here. Wow. You can even see it right there. So I want you to read that and just kind of relate it because I could tell you about it, but you wouldn't really get it as strongly as how it's, you know, just get that content off of reading. Population changes. The bacteria reproduce asexually, so numbers... And this is all down here, by the way. Population changes to page 62, page 63. Um, bacteria reproduce asexually. So the numbers go from 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, all the way up to 64. They keep going uh, exponentially if there's no limiting factors. If there are limiting factors, that's where you start to see that exponential curve come into more of an S curve, which you'll learn about here in a second. Um, I'd love for you to make a graph showing exponential growth it can be totally fake. So 
In fact, if you're looking right here in the book, there's the example. All right, S curves. Um, start exponential, then slow down to constants. This slows down um, the carrying capacity, basically is what slows this down. So S curve is right down here. You start off with exponential growth. You're like, yeah, man, totally growing. This area is great. But then the environment starts to have that limiting factor where you're like, eh, and that's enough out of that. You can only have so many people, I'm sorry, so many of your organism or species around in that environment. Um, the carrying capacity is the ma maximum population size. So that's what you get right here. And um, it's going to say make a fake graph showing an S curve. Well, here it is right here. Um, J curves are a little bit different. So you're going to see, oh, envir sorry, environmental resistance is the area after exponential growth. So like right here is your exponential growth. Your environmental resistance is to the right of there. So just where that's starting to push back against that exponential population growth. J curve is right here. Um, J curve, the population grows exponentially, then collapses. I think this is like the dinosaurs, I guess. Um, dinosaurs came around and they're like, hey man, this is great. There's no one else to compete with whatsoever. Oh no, a meteor hit. Oh my God, there's no sunlight. There's no plant growth. Ah, oh, bummer, bro. Well, it looks like a whole bunch of us are going to die and just drops right off real suddenly. So, um, yeah, diebacks are collapses after the exponential growth. So this right here is the exponential growth. And this right here is the dieback. So, yeah, they got a better example right there. Um, happens because the carrying capacity is exceeded short term but long-term is unsustainable. So overshoot is that where you go past that carrying capacity. So really if the dinosaur carrying capacity before the meteor hit was like right here, all this is an overshoot, but it's an overshoot over a long period of time. So I'd love for you to make a graph showing a J curve, which is this right here. Uh, J curves more common with invertebrates, fish, small mammals, microbes. In real life, graphs usually look like a combination between an S and a J curve. There's very few graphs that look like one or the other. It's usually a combination, which is usually why we get paid big bucks to read them. So hopefully uh, you're doing good. We're going on to chapter 2.2 next. So my best. Bye.